So I just like to welcome everyone to this session. Um, it's a joint session by IECC, which is IB Alumni in Canada, and NEST in Canada. Um, from the IECC, I want us to say a quick thank you to NEST for reaching out and getting together. Um, we have a lot uh, in store for 2021. So this is just the beginning and looking forward to a good collaboration. Right. Um, I know this session is on stocks. Uh, it's a very, emo may become a very emotional session. Uh, this is just a disclaimer for everybody who's here. These are all personal views, personal opinions. Uh, please don't hold us to it. Uh, this is for discussion. And um, what you choose to do after this session is totally your call. Uh, so yeah, just putting that out there. Um, I think we should start not to waste any time so that we have some time for question and answers at the end. So we've got um, two people uh, with us today as our guest speakers. So we have um, Ayub Humayu Ansari. Um, he has a long list of, uh, what do you want to say, qualifications. So I'm, and that goes for some as well. So I'm just going to hold my phone and <laughs> read it to you guys. So he is actually an IBA grad. Uh, he did his BBA in 2007. Uh, I'm sure his name will ring a bell to all of the members of the IBA fraternity. Um, he has multiple certifications. So he is a CFA. He is a Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst and a Financial Data Professional and FDP, which he recently got. And he is the first FDP charter holder in Bahrain. Uh, which is a certification, which is um, basically a combination of data analytics and investment management. Uh, his work experience, he's been with Capital Markets intensely since 2007, so since he graduated. And his expertise is in Pakistan, GCC, and he has a lot of personal investment experience in North American stock markets. So that was our first speaker. And the second one we have is uh, Sami, who is joining us from Pakistan. And uh, he is an experienced IT consultant in Toronto who currently runs his own firm with clients in the US, Canada, and in Pakistan. In his last assignment before starting his own company, he served as a senior product manager uh, at General Motors in Michigan. He is a graduate of NUST and Windsor and holds a master's degree in wireless communications and information processing. So after that introduction, you are all aware that there is no way I could have read that without looking down. <laughs> So thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in on time. Without uh, taking up any more time on my end, uh, I will pass it to uh, Sami, who will start off with a little bit of introduction um, about himself, if you would like to, and then we jump right into our stock session. So thank you. Absolutely a pleasure. And um, I, I bet you that Hassan uh, created, you know, rendered that, that introduction. <laughs> I would have never done so a good enough job. So as, as uh, Mama, thank you so much for having us. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the board members and the organizers for arranging this. I mean, I, it's a great topic, especially given the current circumstances where nowadays everybody's an investor and everybody's a uh, trader. Um, so my main background is I actually, um, um, you know, as a consultant today, I, I consult with, with a lot of Fortune 500 uh, firms with their think tank, with their investment opportunities, um, with their future forecast, especially given the situation, you know, uh, where should they be investing their time, their money, um, what these strategic paths are going forward and a lot of that. Um, today, uh, I, I'm more speaking on behalf of, you know, being a, 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 a regular home hold investor myself. Um, that is a perspective I'm going to be sharing things with. Of course, Ayu has a lot of institutional experience. I, I'm, I want to share more the uh, from the persona of all of us who aren't, uh, you know, aren't CFAs, who aren't uh, financial analysts, who, who just, you know, uh, from our houses, we're, we're trying to invest there. And by the way, beautiful daughter in the background, Mama. <laughs> all right. So without further ado, let me let me share uh, a story I always get. Uh, so let me let me know once you guys can see my screen. Perfect. Okay. So first off, I want to start, uh, you know, start off by saying I am not only going to focus on stocks or bonds or ETFs or cryptos, rather they're all a form of equity. Um, and what I'm about to, uh, you know, uh, share with you guys is true for all forms of equity, whether whether you invest in a house or whatever it may be. So first off, is investing in stocks, ETFs, and cryptos are some ways 
of investing your money or growing your money. It is not the only form of investment. I know a lot of people when they have some savings, they're, you know, they're looking at stocks and they're like, oh, how can I grow my money? Well, don't be that narrow, uh, you know, with your vision. There, there are other opportunities out there as well. You could have uh, as easily invested in a startup or buy a house or, you know, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better word, buy timber from one place and buy, uh, you know, sell it in another place. There are a lot of ways for investment. So never narrow your vision down. If you're uncertain about any um, any of the investment firms or investment portfolios or, or or type of investment, by all means, you're welcome to change. Nothing is holding you to invest in stocks. So, um, and, and, and the reason I bring that up is a lot of people have the, um, you know, uh, missing in action, kind of the MIA, um, or uh, you know, they want to be a part of it because they're hearing from their friends. If you're not comfortable with a form of equity or a form of investment, by all means, look for another one, something that is to your aptitude, to your temperament. Um, stocks and ETFs are one form of them, um, and they're not for the faint of heart. There's, there's a certain level of emotional intelligence you require for them. And the reason I bring that up is I want to share a story. Oh, sorry, uh, and, and a famous thing I want to start off with is there's a bull market somewhere. And this is a famous saying that Jim Cramer, uh, I don't know if you guys watch Mad Money, he always starts off with. And I want to broaden the statement a little bit that this doesn't only apply to stocks. It, invo- it, it applies to any form of investment that you find. There's always an opportunity somewhere. You just have to work to find it. All right. With that, I want to share a story. And this is, again, it is a stock, but it is a form of equity. It is one form of investment. And I want to share a story of Insego, one of, uh, you know, a company I, I know because I have some friends that work for it and it is on the stock market. And the reason I want to bring up the story is because one of my friends has been um, a lot, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's tried to invest in the stocks and I, I shared Insego with him and I, I still remember his emotional turmoil. So I wanted to walk you guys through that story. So started off with uh, with him, you know, about a year ago, he said, hey, I, I, I've got this money saved up and I want to invest in a stock. I said, dude, Insego has a pullback right now. Go ahead and invest in it. Went ahead. He put his money into it. And, and as you can see on the left side here, um, closer to uh, March this year, you know, the stock was going pretty healthy. This is before the pandemic, before anything hit. Stock was going pretty healthy. It was, it was increasing. That's when they just had, uh, you know, signed a deal with, Ver, uh, with uh, Verizon in the U.S., um, as being their MiFi partner. So if, if you guys don't know about Insego, um, Insego has invested heavily in the... So just a quick... Um, I think everyone, including myself, thought that uh, there was some issue with the screen. So this has been intentionally blacked out right now, guys, because I think he's trying to show us the trend. Yes, yes, yes. So I just putting that out there. <laughs> I do apologize. I wanted to black out the rest of it so that I can, I can share the story. Apologies for that. So yes. So if you don't know about Insego, Insego is a company that's invested heavily in 5G space uh, by building their, um, you know, their 4G hotspots, um, and, and, sorry, the 5G hotspots. And, and the goal here was, uh, you know, their vision was no one will be, once a 5G network comes into place, um, people won't be able to leverage it because they won't be changing their phones every time. Um, uh, they change, you know, an average person changes their phone every two years. So the near term investment by any individual would be their, their uh, Wi-Fi device hotspot. And that's why Insego went with a, you know, building a 5G hotspot. Um, and so as soon as they, they did that and they had to deal with, uh, with Verizon in the US, their stock shot up. This is before the pandemic. So he was happy, he made money there. And then lo and behold, the crash in March with the pandemic. And he, he was flabbergasted. He didn't know what to do. And as with everybody else, he sold his stocks there. And I told him, dude, just hold on. And he's like, dude, I, I'm losing a lot of money here. Now, I want everyone on this call to imagine, put yourself in his shoes. You have $10,000 saved up over the last five years of you working. You have $10,000 that you can actually uh, put aside for investment and you don't need for, uh, you know, a liquidity with. Imagine that $10,000 just went from $10,000 to $6,000 in in, in the span of a couple of days there. How would you feel? Do you, you, does everybody remember that feeling? Our hearts just sank. I remember someone telling me that they had an oil portfolio and they had lost a lot of money. And so as everybody else, he sold his stocks there. And then this happened. And he was like, dude, I missed out. And I was like, yeah, the pandemic had nothing to do with 5G. 5G was still going to progress. It had nothing to do with it. And then he bought his stocks again. He's like, okay, you know what? You're right. I'm going to go into this again. And then this happened. 
And he's like, shoot, dude, did it, you know, was it, had it peaked out? Did, was it a momentum? And I was like, no, please hold. And he sold his stocks. And then this happened. And he's like, yeah, you know what? I, I, I was right to sell my stocks. And he went and sold the entire portfolio. He sold 50% first and then sold the rest. He's like, okay, the stock is not going anywhere. And then this happened. And then he went and bought again, and then this happened, sold again, and then this happened, and here's where we are today. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is this is, these are messages I get on a daily basis. We're watching the stock market on a day-to-day -day basis. Dude, the stock market is meant to fluctuate, fluctuate on a day-to-day -day basis. There are so many factors to it, but it begs the question, how do I know if I need, you know, if, if a stock is valuable enough or should I invest in it? And, and that's kind of what I wanted to share with everyone today. So I, I'm sure everybody's aware and done a lot of Google searches on technical, you know, technical um, evaluation of stocks, you know, how do you financially evaluate a stock? But what I wanted to share today is something different, a different aspect a lot of people don't share with, and that is emotional investing. So. The reason I bring it up is there's an aspect of finance and investing that we call behavioral finance. And these are all the things that you should be aware of uh, that, you know, the, 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 you need to be aware of this. You need to understand it and you need to be able to counteract it. And these are very strong feelings, very strong feelings. An example I'd give to you about these and, and you know, everybody's known these feelings from one perspective or the other. We all know the theories behind them, but when it comes to practical implementation of them, that's when we, we, we actually start doubting our own concepts that we've learned over years. There's this, you know, um, I, I've got a huge enthusiasm with planes as well. I, I fly planes myself. Um, and there's, there's a famous thing that I remember by, by one of my instructors when, when we we're in the clouds. So if you ever fly in the clouds, you don't know up or down. You have no idea of orientation. You're, all you're seeing is a big windshield of white. Now, does anyone know how rain fall, uh, flows down? So rain doesn't fall straight down. It falls in an incline with wind. And since you don't know perspective up and down, what ends up happening, every pilot does this, is the first rainfall they face, instead of flying straight like this, they fly like this with the rain because they think they take those raindrops and think that that's perpendicular and they go like this and they fly like this. It's because your body tells you one thing and you lose your instruments. You forget your instruments. You forget to trust them. And that's what happens here. These are your instruments. Learn it, understand it, and then obey them. Now, I know with the time we have, I won't be able to go through all of these. So I did put a link on the bottom. It's a great Zach's article about some of these. Um, those are high level. And then if you do want to go in deeper into these, I wrote the topics out there so you guys can go through some of them. But I do want to share, go deep dive into a little bit of these emotions and, and you guys will be able to understand it. So for example, loss aversion bias, and we've all been there. We don't want to lose money. So what do we do? We make a bad decision, right? We, uh, instead of losing, uh, you know, it, with a fear of loss, we sell quickly. That's loss aversion bias. Status quo bias. And this is a very common thing that I've seen. And this is not just related to stocks. This is related to general life. It's a stress management technique. You're about to hit a loss or you're about to hit a stressful situation. What do you do? I'm not going to do anything. That's status quo bias, right? Endowment bias, or it's also known as anchorment bias. You love something so much that, or it might be that car that your dad gifted you, or it might be your first, I don't know, a laptop. Someone goes and offers you twice the value. You won't sell it. Why? You've got an emotional attachment to it, endowment bias. Regret aversion bias. It, it's, it's one of the most common things. I, 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 I you know, um, if I invest in this and I lose money, I don't want to regret it, so I won't do anything. That's a common psychological bias as well. We've got so many. Overconfidence bias, also known as euphoria bias, i.e. you think this investment is going to do amazing things. You stick with it even though the market tells you otherwise, every indicator tells you otherwise, you're like, no, no, I believe in this. Overconfidence bias. Then there's also the cognitive bias aspects of things, right? I don't wanna go through all of this, but confirmation bias, it, it's a very common one. You believe everything that confirms your current beliefs, right? And it's a, a typical example of this is, 
um, you know, let's take our moms or our dads, you know, in Pakistan, someone tells them you put lemon in hot water, it loses weight. That's what they're going to do. It confirms their beliefs. They'll believe it. You tell them every scientific evidence. Otherwise, they will still do it. Similarly, there's information processing biases, availability bias. Why I'm bringing availability bias? Because this is another typical bias that I see a lot of people face. They haven't read financial statements. They don't know what the market trends are. They make a decision based on that one bit of WhatsApp app that they've got, that WhatsApp message saying this is going to boom. And they make an investment decision based on that. It's availability bias. Mental accounting bias or uh, mental accounting bias or anchoring bias. So mental accounting bias is based on, uh, this is generally true for other equity for, uh, uh, um, equity investments. Dad gave you money, some other person gave you money, you treat the, those monies differently, you invest differently with them based on that. Anchoring bias, again, an emotional aspect. So I, I, I didn't have time to go through all of them, but what I wanted to do was pick out the ones that I know that I've seen a lot of trends with. So learn about these. And this is not just true for finance or investing, this is true in real life. Learn about them, make sure you understand them well and know how to, how to counteract it. And sorry, with the constraint of time, I'm just gonna go through the solution for a lot of these things. So the, the best solution is understand where does an equity drive its value from? And the simple answer is supply demand. Now, what drives supply or demand are multiple factors. Now, for anything, it's overall, overall market trends. You notice people are moving all to solar that everybody's getting a solar panel on their house. What's gonna happen? Solar markets or solar manufacturing or silicon, um, uh, 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 sorry, excavations are gonna go higher. So you know that trend is coming. You know every company that's in associated with it will all trend higher. News, generally political news, government news, uh, there's a hurricane somewhere, uh, earthquake, disasters, all those news have an effect on the stock market. Then company financials in terms of stocks or equities, right? There, you've got multiple tools there that you can evaluate or utilize. So there's, you know, uh, price to earnings ratios, price to book ratios, uh, PEGs, the earning growth potentials. There's a lot of things there. Know your tools, know how to utilize them. Don't just use one tool. Don't be that narrow, uh, you know, narrow vision again. Understand how to evaluate a company, whether where this company stands. What is the multiplication factor for other companies in the same industry? Company news. This is a typical one where Suncor had lost their price. I think it was. 4% on the news of a uh, fire outbreak in, in other plants. That also affects the price of an equity. Then you have the overall economy trend. So the overall economy, you've, you've noticed employment rate is reducing. So that you've got more unemployment, but then we've got multiple other indicators as well. Is the interest rate increasing? That would show a trend towards another form of equity, bonds or something like uh, something else. Are our house prices dropping? Are house constructions increasing? House construction is increasing would imply people have more money to buy houses with. House construction increasing also means people are going to buy more cars. So you can all already assume that automotive market is going to go up as well. These are all connections that you've got to make and understand to be able to analyze what's supposed to happen with the market. And then of course, the future of economy. How are the China and US relationships? Right? All these aspects. So the reason I bring this up is if you're following that number or that ticker, you're already too late. Have a long-term strategy, understand what's happening and then make a decision. And that's it. That was all my slides. I hope that made sense to everyone and sorry for the overage on time, but um, I, want, I wanted to cover the emotional aspect of everything. And yeah. I, I, I know there's Q&A at the end. So by all means, you're welcome to ask questions over there. Yeah, yeah, we will definitely, um, just reiterating, the chat box is also open for questions. And then at the end, we'll have an open session, so the floor will be open. But thank you for that. I'm now going to, uh, without further ado, pass it, um, have a youth presentation up. So thanks, Sami. And give me a second. All right. Here we go. Yeah. So hi. Um, thank you guys. Thank you, Sami. That was a uh, very nicely put. Very Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. This is very <laughs> yeah. Should you want me to yeah. flip? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. And you can flip this as well. Okay, I'm just gonna
Yeah, so uh, Sami gave a very nice overview of, of, of investing and uh, sort of a very personalized overview of investing. And he's been very generous with uh, sharing his experiences. Um, I'm going to talk more specifically on a particular investment class, which has garnered a lot of interest past five, six years, ETFs, exchange traded funds. Um, and I believe uh, ETFs as an investment class is, is very suitable for those people who are just starting off with their investment experience. And I'll dwell on that later. Um, there are various types of ETFs now. Uh, you have pure passive ETFs. Uh, you know, you can buy an S&P ETF, ETF and uh, essentially get S&P exposure with that ETF. Then you have semi-active ETFs, which is a combination of uh, passive and active investments, popularly known as smart beta strategies. And lastly, you have active ETFs. Uh, they're actively managed, they have active bets, they have high conviction in their uh, stock holdings. And one of the really popular active ETFs is ARK Investments or ARK ETFs. Um, what are the advantages of ETFs? Uh, number one, uh, it's a mutual fund which you can get into and exit very easily. And they, it's, it's very cheap, uh, hardly 1% management fee. And unlike uh, mutual funds, you know, you don't have to pay um, a performance fee. Secondly, um, you have an ETF for everything. Think of a strategy and you have an ETF for that. So it offers the world to you in terms of strategies. Thirdly, it's, it's sort of sanitization of stocks. Um, so Amazon right now is above $3,000. Google is nearing $2,000. So, you know, you'll think 10 times before getting into get, getting your hands into Amazon or Google, uh, just because of the fact that they, the price tag is really high may not be too expensive in terms of valuation, but it's just that it's psychological. So you can, buy, instead you can buy an ETF, which gives you exposure to tech. And when we talk about tech, it's Amazon and Google is, is, is inherently part of that tech. Lastly, they are, these are very uh, liquid investments. So there's ease of uh, entry and exit, which is very important from any stock investment uh, point of view. Uh, next slide. So why invest in ETFs? Uh, as I said before, it's 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 ideal for uh, individuals, for beginners. Um, uh, and uh, you can be an, an average Joe in the sense that you can do nothing but just buy the spiders S&P ETF and uh, earn market return. And you'll still be better than majority of the active fund managers out there. Uh, it's just amazing uh, passive investment and what's happened over the last decade. Uh, most of the active in, uh, investors have struggled to generate alpha. Alpha is essentially the excess return over market return. So um, even if you are an average, you will be much, much better off than a lot of other individuals. Secondly, uh, it gives you exposure to a lot of thematic investments like, uh, you know, genomics, uh, AI, 3D printing, um, sitting in Canada, you can buy, have exposure to emerging market stocks, stock markets in India, Vietnam, China, even Pakistan. Then uh, interestingly, you have a, a few ETFs on cryptos coming up. It's a very hot space right now, given whatever's happening over there and the price, the price of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. You can even have commodity exposure with the ETFs. Uh, if you go out there to buy uh, oil uh, futures, uh, it's it's very expensive in the sense the price tag is a lot and your uh, exposure to risk your notional exposure is huge. So a cheaper and alternate alternative and smaller form of uh, investment is maybe buy an oil, oil ETF. You can even buy gain exposure to U.S. Treasury bonds um, and other uh, you know more uh, riskier bonds through ETFs. And you you can even play the cannabis theme theme through ETFs if you want that. Um, and, uh, and most of us, uh, like most of the IB, IB grads, I would assume, um, they don't have, uh, it's difficult for us to uh, understand technology, especially what's happening right now with so many things. There's so much disruption happening. So, uh, and, uh, so in my view, it's, it's better to go with an ETF, which is focused on, you know, disruptive technologies. 
because simply uh, I don't have the eyes to to evaluate tech companies. I just can't see their revenue stream. Uh, I don't have that expertise. Somewhere sitting, some an active ETF manager, you know, who, who has that expertise. I'm much better off uh, trusting my funds to that person than making decisions myself. Um, in my view, as uh, Sami discussed earlier, it's uh, behavioral biases. In my view, you will uh, tackle a lot of behavioral biases by just doing passive investments. And you know, as you gain more uh, uh, confidence, as you gain more experience, more conviction, you can go into more aggressive ETF strategies. You can go for leverage ETF strategies. Um, you can go into leverage commodity strategies. So as I said, uh, ETFs gives the world to you. Um, next slide. So what do I look for when I uh, buy or go into investing in an ETF? Firstly, I do. You need to do some primary research. Um, you go to the the website, look at the fund fact sheet, and each uh, ETF has its prospectus. So, time permitting, it, ideally, you know, you should go over the prospectus, study the pros and cons, the strategy, what the uh, what the investment manager is thinking. Um, so, but usually people don't have the time. They can just go through the fund fact sheet. Secondly, uh, you need to look. Uh, you need to look at consistent returns. Uh, I mean, the the analogy would be, you know, you want someone who's like Virat Kohli, not Shahid Afridi. Uh, you don't want that sort of volatility in returns. You know, you want consistent good returns and ideally returns which are beating the benchmark. Benchmark usually is the S and P five hundred. That's 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 your average investor, and you want an, a fund which is beating the average investor. Liquidity is very important. Uh, the thing to look into is average daily ADTV, not the type over there. Anything above five million, in my view, is very liquid. Good thing about ETFs is that they generally trade close to their NAV, but there are a few exceptions in which uh, there's a there's a big dislocation. So when you look at the fun fact sheet, you'll see historically what sort of NAV premium or discount the ETF has traded. Lastly, ETFs are not foolproof. Uh, a lot of them got liquidated in this crisis in, uh, in, in, in the March sell-off. So you need to keep checking your emails because uh, if a fund is about to liquidate, you'll get a lot of prompts for your, from your book broker or even the ETF manager. Next slide. Yeah, so um, as I have mentioned before, uh, ARC funds, I'm a big fan of uh, this uh, this fund management company. Uh, in my view, if, if Warren Buffet was a f for the analog era, Kathleen Wood, which is, who is the fund manager of ARC, is, is for the digital era. Uh, they specialize in disruptive technologies, uh, AI, blockchain, genomics, um, electric vehicles, and robotics. And, um, and they have a very interesting setup in the sense that uh, their team is mostly comprised of PhDs who are specialized in these their own uh, sectors. So they they can understand the technology and they have the foresight to look into the future economic uh, possibilities uh, of, of of these technologies. So this is something. This is a skill which I lack, and I I think most of the average investors would lack at the moment because we just don't have those eyes. So it's, 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 it's excellent. And plus, I would recommend you to just uh, go to, on their website and uh, subscribe to their podcast. It's an education. It's a real education. And next slide. So, um, so we've talked about, so how to exactly actually implement some of the strategies. Um, when we entered into 2021, there was a lot of talk about value investing because value investing as a, as a theme has underperformed for a very long time. So there's, there, uh, there are a few ETFs. Uh, there's S and S SPGP, which is a ETF themed around growth at, uh, at reasonable prices. Um, so it's, you can gain some exposure over there. Then there was a lot of talk about uh, other region, regional markets doing well, Europe doing well and Japan doing well, because these have so, sort of underperformed the US. So I've mentioned two other ETFs over there, which you can always go and explore. 
Then uh, the big theme, obviously, coming into 2021 was the reopening theme. Uh, whether that's going to happen or not, it's still a big question mark given the cases. But it's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, there's an ETF called SVAL. It's essentially uh, small cap value stocks. And when we talk about reopening, the businesses mostly hit uh, were, were your small uh, SMEs. So when things reopen, these, uh, these businesses should really do well, and the stocks will also uh, react accordingly. Then there's a very interesting ETF. It's called t -Port. It's a three times leveraged transport ETF. Uh, again, if you have more mobility going forward, this will do really well. And assuming that you know we're still stuck in this COVID era, then uh, you can buy an ETF called Work From Home, which is very uh, intuitive. Um, it's a lot to do with companies like Zoom and uh, um, cybersecurity companies. Again, thematically, it's done really well since uh, since listing. And if this situation continues, you know, stick with this ETF. Then another concern heading into this year was inflation, especially food inflation. We've not seen food inflation since 2012, so we're seeing it right now. So we have two, one ETF is corn. You can just, instead of buying a corn future, you can buy this ETF. And the other one interesting is Moo. It's essentially companies exposed to the agribusiness. Then uh, then next point is uh, US dollar weakness. Um, this is again very debatable, but I mean, that was it was the theme heading into this year. So uh, I, for me, Bitcoin is something which is short the dollar, short the US dollar. So you can buy a Bitcoin through an ETF called GBTC. <clears throat> Bitcoin is roughly 32K. This, this uh, ETF is maybe $30, $30 and you get 0 0.01 uh, shares of Bitcoin for with, with this ETF. So, you know, again, it's saturation. Secondly, if, you, if you're a gold bug, then there are a lot of gold ETFs. Um, ESG is something which is uh, very, uh, which is environmental in, uh, investing and, and in, essentially we're greenwashing everything these days. So again, this is, uh, and it, not, finally investment community also becoming more responsible. So there's an interesting ETF, SNP, which essentially uh, weights its investments by the ESG scores. Then in the electric vehicle space, um, there's a very interesting ETF called REMX. Uh, it's essentially an ETF which invests in country in companies across the world, which are into the mining of uh, lithium and cobalt. So it's uh, it's very rare and it's a very niche ETF. Similarly, BAT is again a company which invests in battery technology companies. Then. We, we also thought that emerging markets would do well as the world would open, open up and the dollar would weaken. So a couple of interest, interesting ETFs over there. KMED is something which is healthcare related. Um, even the EMs now will have uh, aging market. So there's a lot, there's secular growth over there. Then SPACs was something which was a craze in, in 2020. If you want some exposure to that, you can buy a SPAC ETF. And last, lastly is the cannabis ETF over MSOS. It's more or less a Biden trade. Again, it's um, it's a very interesting space. Uh, I just wanted to mention it just to uh, give you an idea if you want to explore this uh, opportunity. Next slide. Yeah. Um, and enduring themes technology is here to say uh, you can buy QQQ, which is essentially your NASDAQ e ETF and TQQQ, which is triple times NASDAQ ETF. And uh, if you, as, <laughs> assuming that NASDAQ grows by 20% uh, for the next 10 years, and you, if you invest $1,000 right now in TQQ, this, you might end up with more than 0 0.2, 0 0.3 million dollars. <laughs> so that's just the, that's just the, uh, that's just compounding for you. But obviously it's very risky because it's three times leverage. Then there's a very interesting e-commerce ETF. It's called Clicks. It's 100% uh, long on uh, e-commerce companies and 50% short on brick and mortar retailers like American Eagle, etc. So uh, again, then you have Gamer, which is esports. Uh, I think those of you who have kids, you would see a lot of them actually watching uh, ga game games on t on on the on YouTube. We never esports e on YouTube. I never thought that that was going to be a industry, but it's a big industry now. Then similarly, you have commodity ETFs, you have energy, 
Then there's a very interesting ETF called uh, called Vixi. Right? It's a risk hedging. If you feel the market is really frothy, really expensive, you can buy, you can gain some exposure over here. It's essentially short the market. And uh, lastly, you have uh, interest rates. Interest rates again heading into this year. Um, it's uh, the new administration has taken over. Um, um, the U.S. 10 years yields have actually spiked to last two three months. Uh, so because of inflationary expectations. So it's a bit of a confusing space right now, but I would assume that we're in an environment of lower for longer interest rates. And um, assuming that there's gonna be some correction, you can buy uh, leveraged uh, ETF uh, bonds like TYD and TYO. And lastly is a very interesting uh, ETF called NAIL. It's three times leveraged on house construction. And the price trajectory closely follows the US 10 year yield. So the day you have sort of a contraction in the 10 year yield, the stock really rallies and, and, and converse happens. So just giving you my uh, investment experience over here. Can you just forward? Yeah, so I mean, we've not talked about Pakistan and frankly, there's very little to talk about Pakistan uh, because Assuming that most of you over here uh, would like to preserve your purchasing power in dollar terms. Most of the Pakistani companies are rent seekers and you know, old world uh, companies. Uh, there's hardly any technological disruption over there. The really exciting space in Pakistan is unfortunately unlisted. It's where Sayyid Sami has a lot of exposure, I'm assuming. But uh, you know, and there's, I'm sure there's a lot of exposure in startup and techs, but Unfortunately, that exposure is not available in at PSX. So yeah, I've given these uh, three, four uh, useful resources. Uh, you can look into their, these websites and you know um, start your investing uh, career with them. So yeah, that's it from my side. All right, um, amazing. So thank you both, uh, that was very helpful. We will be sharing um, both their slides uh, with all of you uh, through our ICC and NASQN platforms. Uh, so you will have access to this information. Um, just uh, looking over if we have, okay, so we have a question here. So when you say you will be better off with EDFs than most with little effort, how long do we need to invest for in this case? Also, reminder for everyone who joined in later, these are all personal opinions. Do not hold us to them. Please don't come back to us and say, you told me to invest in this and now look what happened. So, but go on, who, are you, you wanna take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, this more or less, it's, it depends on your, um, on your own personal liquidity requirements and uh, and if if you're if you've not learned much about investment in 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 this time period, if you've not looked at if you've not learned how to analyze stocks or read financial statements, then keep on investing in that ETF. Uh, maybe do calendar investments, uh, put an X amount of uh, of investments start of every month, and um, and then it's a call on on your liquidity requirement. If you need to exit, then obviously you need to liquidate it. So, yeah. One thing I'd, I'd probably add to that as well is market trends as well. So investment in ETF, for example, nowadays, or let's say 10 years ago, um, oil was a big, big boom. Of course, we, we didn't have ETFs back then, but let, let's just assume back then I would have invested in the oil business. But now if I know, and, and if I'm a long-term investor and this is my RRSP fund, um, 10 years from then, um, now I know that, you know, Oil might not be the big, big uh, gold mine that we we're looking for, and we would be looking for EVs or, or something different or renewable energies. You can find ETFs for those. So, uh, you know, um, as you've said, it, it might be a liquidity thing. So, it, if you want to liquidate your assets, by all means, but it might also be a market trend change or a belief sh uh, change. So, each of those can again can be um, um, you know uh, triggers for for buying or selling ETFs. Another thing I, I wanted to add to that more you know importantly learn to shave off your profits as well. Make sure you're not all vested in uh, all eggs in one basket and, and make sure you diversify likewise. And then you can see which ones perform better, um, you know, if there are any trend changes and then, and then you can, um, you know, uh, reshuffle your portfolio that way. 
All right. Um, I see the next question. It says, is there anything in particular we need to take care of in terms of U.S. funds, additional disclosures and filings? Um, I'm unsure as to what that is exactly pertaining to. Are you asking about tax wise? And I don't think we have to uh, the expertise to answer that. But if you want to um, unmute, I can see you there and maybe uh, pose that question in your own terms and go ahead. Yeah, sorry if it, that wasn't clear. I was just uh, uh, curious if, uh, for example, some of the, these ETFs invest in U.S. companies. So if we're, uh, as Canadians, investing in them, is there anything uh, additional we would need to file or does it just like work smoothly because it's all integrated? I was just uh, curious about that. So uh, are you are, are you aware of the Canadian tax? No, no, no you go ahead. This is, this is okay. your domain. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, as a Canadian, you are allowed to invest in, in the U.S. companies. Actually, to be honest with you, one of the benefits of the stock exchange is you can invest wherever you can get your funds in. Um, it, it, it would be different if you wanted to invest in the Nikki, for example, or, or any other ones, because it's hard to get uh, funds over there. So you'd generally be looking for an ETF or, or, or uh, um, a risk reciprocal there. For Canadians, you are more than welcome to invest in U.S. funds. There's actually no tax issues related to it. Uh, the only issue is when you sell, um, you're, you're getting it back in Canadian dollars and, and, and the valuation of, of uh, Canadian dollar to U.S. dollar is the only thing you need to consider there. And it's the same for investing in Pakistani companies or any companies in the world. So if you're investing in a U.S. company, by all means do so, but make sure you're keeping um, a bridge the U.S. dollar Canadian and the U.S. Canadian dollar difference. Um, and and if, if you do invest in a U.S. company, there is a good chance your bank will send you a, a W-8 Ben form. Uh, which is a disclosure to ensure that you are not a U.S. resident so that you don't have to pay taxes over there uh, and, and make sure you respond to the W-8 pen. If you are a U.S. resident and you're investing from Canadian, then you'll get a W-9 form for taxation. No problem. Okay. Um, and then we've got, uh, how do you identify the best performing industry-specific ETFs if I am a passive investor? Yeah, so... Um... So then uh, this, for that you need data. Um, I'm spoiled because I have the access to Bloomberg terminal, so I can look at a lot of uh, securities. Um, if you're I mean, reading, yes. Yeah. So I, so it's, uh, it's, it's a very good question. Um, you will just have to do a lot of uh, legwork over here. You'll need to follow a lot of other e ETFs in, in that sector. I mean, that's, that's what I can say. Um, Quality data is not available for free anymore. Uh, everyone's charging for data now. So yeah. it, you need to be on your toes over here. I envy you, by the way, for having Bluebird data, by the way. <laughs> That's an expensive membership <laughs> that I can't afford. <laughs> yeah. For those who don't know, Bloomberg is is a huge uh, 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 firm that, uh, that has a lot of analysis on a lot of these. Zax is another one that, that is for more of us consumers. Bloomberg is a more institutional one. So... I envy you for that, but I, I will probably ask you for data. Uh, and and as you said, <laughs> there is no good answer to this one. This is actually more of market trends. And, and, and whenever someone asks me a question like this, I generally tell them, what do you believe will be the future, right? So think from five years from now, what do you think, will, uh, where the market's gonna end? Where What's everybody gonna use? Um, and whatever answer you come up with might be the first, um, you know, might be what you're going to utilize to figure out what ETFs are, are related to that. And of course, Ayub is the ETF guy. I'm the stocks guy. Um, um, he, he's got more experience than I do, though. Uh, but I, I, I actually have the liberty of having my own analysts. So I actually have analysts who, who look at stocks. Um, so we are looking at, at uh, you know, where are we going to be in five years from now? And that's what we believe in. And that's what we invest in. Um, but that's that's where I start off. All right, thanks. Um, and then we've got a question here. Um, what's your option about robo advisors? I, I'm not sure. What that is. Um, so I, I mean, uh, so uh, it's this is more or less the future. It's, the future is essentially a marriage of robo advisors and 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 and, and the human. Um, so they have their uh, advantages. Humans have. We have our own advantages. Uh, one thing is that robot devices would would bypass a lot of the behavioral biases, which Sami discussed earlier. So um, it's there. I mean, it's uh, pretty much the future. And uh, one just, the the one problem with the robo advisors, it's 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 a generic problem, is that uh, there's a lot of similarity of these uh, in in these automated strategies. 
so if you find any robo advisor who says that you know uh, we stand or our strategy is very different so your antenna sh antenna should immediately rise there should be a red flag in your in, in your thought process and you should ask for uh, you know confirming evidence uh, performance because in my uh, experience a lot of the strategies are are fairly similar and you know there's very little uh, differentiation but yeah if some you have anything to add to that you oh, I, I absolutely agree with you on that one um robo advisors and, and 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 we're all engineers or or financial you know have financial backgrounds here so just imagine yourselves if you had a robo advisor what would you be looking at it would be looking at the technical data you'll be looking at trends um it won't be able to understand the behavioral aspects and and a lot of the issues i see today by the way <laughs> are probably driven by robo advisors where we've got huge momentums going on and stocks just skyrocketing and, and then dropping I, I i think it's adding to the problem we've had a a market burn in the past which was you know all black box uh trading um you know there was a trickle down effect and then all the quants had, had, had their hats on figuring out what happened and then we had a meltdown i don't have as much experience with the robo advisors i know the concept i i utilize them very seldomly uh and and i i'm i'm in sync with you they're all based on the same technical data yeah i mean uh, uh there's a very interesting uh, person it's him his name is jim simons uh um I think he had a book uh, there's a big on book on him it's called maybe maybe I'm paraphrasing over here but the book name is uh, the Ma man who solved the market so he's like the uh, you could say the pioneer of robo uh, advisors or robo investing but he has a very uh, uh, the problem with him is that he's not like Warren Buffett or he's not like Catherine Wood he's very um, you you he's very opaque you don't know much about him so we don't know much about his strategies but his returns are by far uh, i mean warren buffett returns are nothing compared to his returns over past 30 years but unfortunately his strategies are not open for public so uh, it's black box but it's a black box that's worked very well for him and his investors so do 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 uh, look at this uh, book the man who solved the market um and then i think this may be a question uh that a lot of people have right now so we looked at the fact that we have a lot of benefits for first time investors when we're looking at etfs but what what if, what's the drawback or what do you think is one of the disadvantages of etfs oh. ah, go ahead um, um well i'm i'm biased so um <laughs> i'm going to tell you that one of the biggest drawbacks of an etf is well it's a drawback and it's a pro for some it it it, it muffles and and regulates the gain and the loss right and that's a good thing for a lot of people as well um and and as as you said um you you want the uh, virat kohli or actually you know what i'm going to rephrase that you want the misbah and you don't want the <laughs> you, you sometimes want that tuk tuk effect right so you want a, a a regular uh return on a monthly basis rather than having a jump in return and then a big huge loss so etfs help with that muffling effect for sure the second one is uh with ETFs you don't you you aren't really the one who's doing a lot of the research you're not balancing the portfolio um you you're you're uh, leveraging highly skilled people who are looking at those financial statements they're doing it um and and and, and uh, you know that that's a big pro there on on the stock side if if you don't go with this ETF you go with the stocks um you're the one who's doing who's doing a lot of that information and you actually if you understand that market well so for example if i'm investing in stocks I'm not generally investing in housing related or renovation related stocks. I'm generally investing in IT related stocks because I know that market, I know that industry. I consult for a lot of those Fortune 500 firms. I know where the market's going to go. Um so the biggest pro for me on the stock side is I'm I'm able to leverage on a um on a very uh, niche level the 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 uh the strategies that each one is doing how to differentiate in the market uh, that you won't be able to do with an ETF. So there's pros and cons to both. Um so I I won't say it's um you know don't go etf don't go stocks um it, it it it's basically your your emotional your temperament actually has a huge um um uh, you know uh, is a huge constituent of this decision and then your returns and how much time you're willing to invest in it has a huge uh, uh bearing on this as well yeah i'll just like to add on that uh, when you're buying an etf you're bu buying essentially a basket of stocks so a basket may have good eggs it may have may have a bit of rotten eggs as well so it's a bit of a trade off um 
but I look at ETFs as an educational opportunity as well. Um, I'll again revert back to ARK funds. Um, I have never bought any shares in, in ARK funds, but I've bought a lot of her picks. Um, I mean, she's been a bull on Tesla for a very long time. And I essentially got convinced and I bought Tesla and, you know, the returns were fantastic. So look at it from an educational point of view as well, especially if you're a beginner. So yeah, everything is not just returns initially. You need to educate and, you know, gain that market um, insight or intuition. Uh, this intuition cannot be bought. It cannot be taught. It just comes through experience in my yep. view. Um, this is maybe something we can add to your presentation. You, there's the, uh, most of the ETS mentioned were US. If you are aware of any Canadian equivalents or any Canadian versions, uh, maybe not off the top of your head and you can add it. Yeah, not are. at the top of my head, unfortunately. Maybe Sami can. <laughs> I actually, I, I'm not an ETF. Well, uh, uh, you know, reality is you can buy a lot of the US dollar ETFs in, in the Canadian market as well. If you want to maintain your Canadian dollar, um, there, there's an equivalent of some of them. I mean, I know there's an EV one, but uh, since I'm not a big investor in TTF, I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but there, all you have to do is a, is a good Google search. You'll find them. There, there's definitely some of them. Okay. Amazing. And I think this might be the last question of the day and it's probably one of the most interesting ones. So what are your thoughts on the current valuations in the market? Which is, I know something we think about probably invest people who've invested, think about it every day. So do you think forward returns may be impacted due to the high valuations, especially in the tech sector? Yeah, so, Again, um, personal opinions here. <laughs> I Sammy, can for the analyst here. <laughs> okay. So, um, so valuation is again, um, there was a, there was a uh, meme going around in the investment community of which they showed a few traders on the trading floor. And uh, the joke was, the alarm was that someone said the F word. F word over here is fundamentals. Uh, so the market's been so crazy, um, you don't know what the fundamental is. But um, if you look at, uh, if you take a look around, if you look at how, how technology is changing, it's progressing, there's so much disruption across every, every, uh, every industry. Um, it's very difficult to, at the, at the moment, see what the world will be or what the companies would be five years from now. Um, you know, one example is that of Amazon. Uh, their earnings have grown 30 times since 2015. Who, Way back in 2015, no one would, would have thought that the Amazon would grow 30 times, Facebook would, would grow 10 times. So um, these are, it's, it's, it's an evolving uh, uh, environment. Secondly, um, one Im important thing about valuations is, is the interest rate trajectory. Um, and again, there's so many moving parts with the interest rates. Uh, something which was unprecedented in Trump's term was that <laughs> the president himself sort of hammered the Fed to, uh, to lower the interest rates. Who would have thought that this would ever happen? But, you know, that became, that, that's a fundamental, it's a fundamental change. And, you know, it impacted valuations. Um, and given the fact that the, U.S. Um, generally, the government or, or, or the electorate, they're so sensitive to the share share, ma share market, the movements, um, uh, that itself is such a big pr pressure on the Fed not to raise rates. So, unfortunately, it seems that we're in an environment where we'll be, we, where we will be in a lower for maybe forever interest rate environment because there's so much circularity over here. If the U.S. raises its interest rates, um, the dollar strengthens against the euro, the yuan, the Japanese yen, and um, and then US, U.S. loses out on it on its competitiveness. So, secondly, uh, who's going to foot the bill? Who's going to pay uh, the greater interest rate on um, on on government bonds? So, it's a very complicated, a very confusing um, environment. Within that, keeping that in perspective, um, and given the fact there's so much technological change happening. I think tech as 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 a theme will continue to outperform, and um, we'll need to redefine what value is. Um, and the problem is that uh, this is the new world. We're in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, previously, uh, you know, metrics like price to book, price to earnings, uh, they made a lot of sense because there was a tendency of mean reversion uh, because the world wasn't changing as fast as what it is right now. So mean reversion 
maybe it no longer counts because history maybe does not even count. So uh, valuation again is very subjective. Uh, we'll get we're, we're going to have a plethora of uh, passive investment. A lot of retail investors coming into the market. It's going to maybe we'll need to define value. And uh, if you feel it's, it's that multiples are high right now, you might be wrong. You might miss out on a lot of opportunities. Very true, actually. Um, just wanted to add a little more to it. So, uh, by the way, um, I, I know not all the group is is very familiar with uh, with finance. So, one key factor that that you mentioned that uh, you know, if, if you're not familiar with finance, I want you to research is the what the interest rate means for an economy, um, and and you know what effects it has on bonds, what effects it has on exports and imports, and and you know wh why they want to maintain lower interest rates, um, but. Adding on to what Ayub said, I absolutely agree with him. Um, I am still a, a person who, who who believes in the fundamentals and, and you know uh, the the. Uh, but even if you know even if it, even the fact that I do believe in that, uh, you know it, it's of course the multiplication factor for a lot of these companies in the same sector is is humongous compared to where they were before, and it's the basic supply demand. And if you've got a lot of retail investors coming in, uh, choking the demand and uh, choking the supply, and of course uh, valuations have gone higher. Now there are multiple theses that these investors are here to stay. The 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 the, the, the valuations will be maintained. Uh, but that being said, I still do want to help everybody understanding. You know the fundamental of the question itself. Um, I, I think they're trying to infer: is, is there a bubble going on? Now the answer for that isn't as simple. Um, there might be bubbles in certain sectors or certain companies, and not in others. Now, for example, Tesla, according to me, is a huge bubble. That being said, according to fanatics for it, or, or actually people who, who believe in its, its, its ideology, for them, it's, it's a completely justifiable valuation. And, and so it's very hard to justify. And the only way to know if it was overvalued or not is, of course, when, it, when it's in the past. And that, that's, the, that's the sad truth about a lot of these. So you're, you're making bets on, on where the company is going to go. Um, for example, me, you know, uh, I don't know, five years before this, I was like, the only reason that company is valuable is because it's Elon Musk and he, and he knows how to market the company very well. Um, and there was actually a thing going on. It was, it was a huge, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a huge way where a lot of people were raising uh, capital. It was uh, that IPO, you'd see a lot of YouTube ads on them. You'd see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, non-regulated or, or I, I guess, uh, questionable material on them, which would raise the price for them because it, they attract a lot of marketing attention. People would buy them, the prices would get raised, and, and that's how they, they'd gain the capital. That was happening as well at, at, a, at a point in time. And it was especially true for, and, and again, my, my statements are generic. So it was especially true for uh, you know cryptocurrencies. So as soon as a cryptocurrency would launch, you'd see YouTube ads on it, you'd see Google ads on it. What would happen? It would create a huge buying spree on that, uh, you know, surge this, uh, the the demand for it, and the price would skyrocket only to collapse when 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 it was gone. Everybody knew about Litecoin. Everybody knew about you know weird currencies that came up. So uh, my statements are generic towards that. Of course, the SEC highly regulates what's happening on on the open uh, open markets. But so the fact you know uh, going back to the question. Is there a bubble or not? Unfortunately, we'll only know uh, with time. I do agree um, that valuations have increased for a lot of these companies. Um, and if you want to do still the safer bet, uh, you know, uh, you're welcome to go for companies that you think are, are you know are still justifiable. But as you've said, if, if things pertain the way they are, this, these valuations might be here to stay, and you might miss out as well. So it, it is a dilemma in itself. Okay, great. So I think, yeah, we're, we literally just hit our one hour mark. So thank you. Um, uh, you know, we will, again, with the video will be up soon and we'll share the slides that Ayub and Sami both shared. Um, on behalf of IACC and Nestian, thank you both for taking out the time. Uh, I know there was a lot of back end coordination for this. So I appreciate you guys taking this, um, you know, the time out and putting in the effort for this. So thank you from our side, um, Esan. Just a word, thank you so much, Mama. Just a word of gratitude and thanks to all the IB alumni. It was uh, fun working with you guys. And Mama, thank you so much for moderating the event and coordinating behind the scenes. I know it takes a lot of time to actually put together an event that is only one hour long, but there's a lot that goes through it. So really appreciate it. I enjoyed the session. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it as well. Absolutely. Thank, you. thank you. So thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Here, guys.